Caroline Dowd Higgins. Thank you for listening to Your Working Life, my podcast series featuring thought leaders in the career and personal growth arena. I know that you spend a significant portion of your life at work, so I'm on a mission to provide you with tools, inspiration, and resources so you can enjoy your career and love your life. And I am so delighted to have my very special guest with me today, Wendy Waldbridge. Wendy, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm so pleased to be here and especially to meet you. You're amazing, Caroline. Well, back at you. We were just sharing before the show started for our audience members that we are we are in a similar space and that we are passionate about empowering women. So what a joy to have you on. And Wendy, I want to tell our audience about you. Wendy Walbridge is a strategic and intuitive advisor to Fortune 100 leaders and teams across industries and a pioneer in the coaching field. And she's earned a reputation for for establishing breakthrough conversations that enhance the way women work. Also, how they live and play and contribute in life. And her singular brand of coaching is defined by her spiral up model that empowers women to become architects of their own lives by following a radically different roadmap to success. And today, we're gonna dive into this juicy conversation about Wendy's book, Spiraling Upward, the five co-creative powers for women on the rise. So, Wendy, you're speaking my language, my dear, but what brought <laughs> you What brought you to this work? And I'd love for you to fill our audience in about your story. How did you get to where you are now? Oh, I would love to. <laughs> you are amazing, Caroline. I'm just laughing because the name of your book, This Is Not the Career I Ordered, I know you have another book coming out soon, but This Is Not the Career I Ordered is so completely like it could have been the same title for my book in a way. <laughs> We've all been there, right? <laughs> yeah, and the the whole idea is, um, and I'll, I'll be glad to get into my story and weave that in with sort of why our books are so aligned. I mean, you definitely tackle different things in your book, and I come at it at a different approach, but there are, our purpose is so similar in that women's path to fulfillment is different from the masculine-defined path to success. I agree. And yet, that's the only one we knew because men have been in the business world and the political world and in all the other arenas before we were. And they've sort of laid down the foundation. So it's up to us to re-engineer and sort of pave our own roadmap to fulfillment and success. Because for us women, you know, success without fulfillment is failure. And so I just love that, you know, our books have the same intent, I think, is to give women the tools to follow their own and design their own path to what really will be fulfilling for them. And, and how that ties into my story and why that became an important mission for me uh, was that early, early on in my life, like in my 20s, I had already, you know, stumbled upon this work of doing transformational coaching at a very young age. This was in the late 70s. And um, it was also very new to the culture. There wasn't really a lot of coaches out there. There wasn't even teamwork in companies and right, things right. like that. So we had to sort of like convince people of the value of it before there were no budgets. But the, the interesting thing was I got into this field because I knew that I wanted to figure out a way to make money doing what I really wanted to do, which was to help people realize who they really were and to be free of the suffering that our minds can create for us that get in the way of the bliss and the, the, the joy that we can have when we're connected to our true selves. So I got into that really early because I experienced the opposite of that. I experienced the challenge of my mind sort of dominating me. And it came to a, a real head when I was about, I'd been, it found this field that I loved, transformation. I was working with two physicians who had wanted to bring the tools of teamwork and human potential to people in healthcare. And we had opened up the, the field of technology as well and gotten into IBM. And, and I was leading and coaching and um, leading in my company and also coaching other people to become coaches. And really, really into it all. But then we were also partying and staying up really late every night and pushing it. And it was in the seventies, you can imagine. Um, there was, for me, I was starting to not be in touch with what I really 
knew was part of my own personal fulfillment, which included singing and dancing and having time off and having some spaciousness in my life. But it was like a startup. And we were doing that and we were staying up late. And one morning I woke up and I couldn't move. And I was immediately diagnosed with a life-threatening blood disease that changed my life forever. Um, I was told that I would have this disease forever and I would be on the medication, which was a very potent medication that changed the way I thought, my ability to sleep, everything um, for the rest of my life. So that set me in a completely different direction. And I won't go into detail about the whole story of it, but I will say that the most painful part of the ordeal, which lasted for 14 years, was not the physical suffering, although there was quite a bit of that. Uh, it was the pain in my head for not being able to live up to what I thought I should be. I was so connect identified with a type A personality and living that masculine path to success on some level. Like that was all that I thought there was. was achievement and being the being the sort of servant to my mind, which told me, you need to do this, you should do that, you need to do this. But I could no longer do it. So I had to discover this other part of myself that was much, fortunately, I discovered much more loving, much more whole, and much more complete in terms of what I really wanted in my life. So it, it just, it made me discover this whole other part of me. And it was, it was really meant to be in a way, you know, how people say, I wouldn't wish that on anyone, but it was the best thing that ever happened to me. I, I, I the end of the story is that I, after 14 years of having lupus, I lost my kidney function and was on dialysis for a year and a half and then um, received a miraculous kidney transplant from a donor. And today, 20 years later, I still have that kidney. I'm on no medication and I'm quite the miracle story. You really are, Wendy. What an inspiration. And and I really thank you for being so genuine and authentic and, and also sharing, you know, the difficult times, because I think that's so important for women to know that it's it's not always perfect and that's okay. And yeah. we can fail forward and we can celebrate and and your reinvention has just been so beautiful. And and what I love about your message is now you are the architect, right? You are designing this juicy life as you write about in your book and you inspire so many others to do that. So I, I thank you. Thank you. Let's talk, Wendy, though, about why this is a great moment in time, in history, for, for women to take the lead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, if you, first of all, Hillary is now running for president, which is right. fantastic. And it's such a, a big um, moment because it's a symbolic moment on a certain level. It represents this women rising that's happening all over the world. That there is now, and I want to say, you know, that women are more degreed, more represented in in all the economic, political, in different sectors of the world, business sectors, than they ever have been. Right. And we we have very far to go. We still have far to go, and we're working. So many people are working in different ways to resolve the gender inequity and the 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 pay gap and all the different important things that are even more serious than that in other countries. So there's the progress and there's the gap that we all see. But why, what's deeper than that? What's deeper than that is that not just women are rising, but there's a feminine energy that's rising. And what I mean by that is for so many years, we've been dominated by the masculine paradigm. And that masculine paradigm is really important in that it helped us build structures and science and get advancements in technology. It's the rational, linear, um, ob sort of objective way of, of, of doing things. But where we need to go next as a society and a culture really has more to do with the feminine energy of inclusiveness and connecting and holistic and the healing that we need on our planet and the the uh, leadership that we need in our world has to include this other aspect. It's just we can't go any farther with the masculine alone. So I would say because that's happening in so many ways, if you look around, that 
there's a great opportunity for women to lead with their natural strengths, the things that are really, really needed in our in our world today. And I could go into more detail about what those look like if you want or why that is, but I, I'll leave it at that for at the moment. Yeah, I would love for you to go into more detail because I think it's so important to really help our listeners understand we're we're on uh, we're at a tipping point, and I think we're we're finally there. Gosh, it's taken such a long time, but women are the economic drivers, as you said. We're the degree earners, and and this is this is our time. and And I'd love for you to dig a little deeper. Would you please? Yes, absolutely. Um, let's see where where would I start? Let me think for a second. So. The thing first to distinguish is what is what do I mean when I'm saying feminine feminine leadership? What it, what is that? Um, and the thing I think about women that I notice is, and, and it's I want to be careful not to stereotype here because there's there's a gender uh, spectrum where you might be more identified with a feminine but not have a, a female body. Let's uh-huh. say. Uh-huh. So I really want to include that as as we talk. But what's been seen from deep studies is that there is a demand for what's called, it's sort of an emergent form of leadership that women happen to be, many women happen to be more sort of locked and loaded with, they're more hardwired with, which is like empathy, collaboration, our ability to plan for the future, compassion, flexibility, uh, humility, connectivity, relatedness, and selflessness. Mm -hmm. Now, not every woman is like that. And a lot of women act more like men, and we could even go into that. But what when, you know, when John Gerzema, who's a friend and has been one of the speakers at one of our uh, women's gatherings here in Silicon Valley called Women's Evolutionary Leadership, he was one of our first speakers. And he wrote the book, The Athena Doctrine, which was documented the, the, the tagline is how women and men who think like them will rule the future. And his he documented with his Pulitzer Prize winning co-writer um, 64,000 interviews around the world looking at intractable problems and say, looking to see what are the what do people want in terms of a leader? The people who were solving the intractable problems had more of what were categorized as feminine strengths the things that I just mentioned, as opposed to masculine strengths. That's one of many, many studies that are out um, that show that, you know, this is our time. This, this is a time when we are really needed. If you think about the, the uh, financial collapse that happened uh, with Lehman, you know, Christine Lagarde was famous for saying, Boy, if the Lehman brothers had had been Lehman sisters, the crisis would look different. <laughs> so true, right, right, right. Because we have an ability to think more cautiously, and we, you know, for many years, being aggressive and risk taking might have been the, the the way to do things. But it's there's a way that women can be that has to do with um, being a little more cautious about risk that could be. Uh, for an example, one of the most important things for our time. Do you want me to go more? Say I, more? I would love to. Yes, please. Oh, sure. I, yeah. So um, when I think about feminine and masculine, when I think about what, what are we, why is this a great time for women? We, we also are, we're also confronted with the fact that there's there's not a lot of receptivity to our leadership sometimes. So we have to confront the fact that like in, in, I'm here in Silicon Valley, so there's a lot of um, a lot of focus going on the fact that women are do leave technology and they don't uh, succeed in technology as fast because of things like what are called like bro grammar mm-hmm. culture or the frat boy culture and the misuse of, power and the mistreatment of women. And so, and, and then really being honest and transparent about all the gaps between the leadership, the lack of leadership of women in these companies as, as they're worse than some of the other companies in the United States, technology companies here in the Valley. But what's great about that is that we're really looking at it and we're really looking at, wow, why is this and what needs to change as a result of it? And it isn't just a matter of putting more women in the roles. 
and and you know helping expecting them to survive it has to do with providing it's very unconscious there's some things that are in the sort of in the soup that need to be addressed that have to do with in, in, um, second generation bias unconscious bias nobody's meaning to exclude women right. it's just that it's a, a a habit and we're pattern recognition human beings so we will hire what we've seen before and we will do what seemed to work before but it's a new day yes it is it's a new day and what worked before is not going to work in the future you know for example um you know, they used to have like formal rotations in sales and operations that that would be a way for a senior to become a senior leader in companies. But men are more likely than women to have held such jobs. So the requirements are sort of outdated when it comes to the kind of experience that best really best prepares a woman to lead a person to lead in this kind of culture that we're in, where we're interconnected, interdependent, where organizations are flat or they're matrixed. What's really important is that we can communicate, collaborate, um, share credit, uh, you know, be nurturing, empower other people. All the things that women love to do and are good at, we're called transformational leaders, right? So, Wendy, I'd love to take that a step further because what I love, love, love about your book is that it's solution-oriented, and you actually created a roadmap for women, and you call it this spiral-up roadmap. So talk to us about that and how that really gives women concrete action steps. Yeah, thank you. I, I Thanks for shifting gears there. So the book I wrote really came out of my own work with women. I kept looking at over and over again, I coach both men and women, but I had coached a lot of women. And what I noticed was there was a theme, the things that they needed next, what would, when they were reinventing themselves to their next highest level of expression and most tr truest level of expression, what, what did they need next? And there were these steps that kind of unfolded. And that's how I designed the book. So what I noticed is that when we're locked into a limited view of who we are, in the spiral map that I put in the book, there's three levels. There's, there's initiation, there's aspiration, and then there's inspiration. And we move through these three levels as we evolve ourselves from identification with our egos. And that's not like, there's such, that's such a loaded word, ego. What I really mean is when we have a limited viewpoint about ourselves. Right. It could be good or bad. It just it's limited. It's 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 a pattern. Instead of seeing that we really actually are fluid human beings, we are c capable of changing. Anything is possible, but we get kind of concretized around these identifications, and then we get stuck. But when we can break out of that, and by the way, in that loop, that bottom loop, there's also a trance of scarcity. We often think, if I win, you lose, and um, there's not enough good jobs, there's not enough money, there's not enough men, there's not enough opportunity. We come from a negative glass half empty point of view. And I could even go into more of why the brain works that way, but let's just leave it at that for now. So, so what okay. I'm hearing though, Wendy, is that th there are opportunities for women to make the shift. And, and you yes. talk about that too in your book so beautifully. So what's What's a shift, or maybe the biggest shift, let's focus on that, that women can make in order to be fulfilled? Thank you. The biggest shift is no longer identifying with that ego and then discovering instead that there's a part of you, a part of every single person who's listening right now, who knows the part of her that wants to bring more goodness and beauty and truth to the mm -hmm. world. And that wants to make whatever situation you're in better. That's so much who we really are, like who really wants to always improve something so that it could be even more flourishing. And we sometimes get captured by the ego, but that's the part of us that's the naysayer and, oh, no, you can't do it. And don't try to change. It'll be too hard. <laughs> this, I know, yeah. I'll yeah. have it. It doesn't necessarily go away, but you can develop a different relationship to it by identifying with the part of you who really is your essence who really is the spirit of who you are, who, who is what Craig Hamilton calls your evolutionary self. 
And that, just that connection to that part of you and starting to listen to that voice rather than the other one will shift you into being able to be connected to your wisest wisdom. And that will allow you to start moving in this next realm of aspiration for who you are becoming rather than something you're getting or just earning money so that you can then retire or some kind of soulless life that doesn't really turn you on. So it's this shift from ego to evo, if you will, or from ego yep. to essence that really, really helps. Good stuff. So I know in, in your coaching practice, you have probably worked with thousands of women who were navigating perhaps a career advance opportunity, advancement, or maybe taking on a new leadership role, you know, reinventing and in so many ways. And, and you and I also know, since we're in the trenches, there are external and internal barriers. So would you walk our audience through that? Yeah. Uh, we Well, we all know there are many kinds of external barriers. There are the structural barriers, the things like not being sensitive to women's own ways of working. And work was designed sort of like an assembly line. It's based on the Industrial Revolution. It hasn't been revamped since then. <laughs> so true. It, it, it was never designed for women to be 50% of the workforce, I'll tell you that. Right, right. And, you know, com companies are paying attention because they realize there's a talent shortage coming up and they're going to need women. And women are, when women are in leadership positions, ROI goes up and creativity goes up and innovation goes up. So, People, companies are smart ones are paying attention to what's going to make our organization be women friendly and support women in thriving and leading. And I'm working with some of those companies and I love the work that they're doing. So what do you, what are the external barriers? They're the habits that exist um, in terms of just like, first of all, women's lack of access, access to um mentors or role models to networks and sponsors those are precious resource for women and important uh the like i said before the unconscious bias that exists that that help that has that bias it created entrenched organizational structures and work practices that fit men's lives but don't have anything to do with how women want to work you know women should be able to <laughs> i was reading um Claire Shipman's book, how she talks about women should be able to 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 run their business from Starbucks if they need to. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's got to be more flexible, and uh, and you know we've got to enlist the men in helping change things. Not it's not about leaving them behind. They they want to help. So many of them do, and they just don't know. A lot of them know how to help, and if women don't find their voices and start to lead the changes by taking a risk of, of not fitting into the status quo, we won't get there. So those are the external. I've, made, I've mentioned a few of the external. And, you know, it's just, it's it also the other thing about, you know, the masculine leader being associated with decisiveness and aggression as being the leader. Well, that's not women's way. We mm -hmm. don't lead that way. We lead in a very intelligent way, but it has to do with sometimes building consensus, uh, collaboration, listening, uh, bringing everyone along, you know, there's just a whole nother type of leadership that's coming, that's emerging, that's necessary for the times that we live in and the trends that we see ahead, that companies are going to have to modify their, their practices to, and their policies to support and enable. Um, but having said all that, the number one thing that holds women back and this comes from many, many studies, is what's called confidence. And I want to say that from three different points of view. Confidence in that we believe in ourselves and that we hold ourselves in the same regard that the people around us do, instead of just thinking lower than of ourselves and even the people that know how amazing we are. So confidence, that's something, and that takes some inner work to, to, to shift but also confidence that this work, this place that I work in is going to support me in succeeding. Do we have confidence in that? So that's something that will come as we start to change the systems so that they accommodate women better. And then the third kind of confidence is really about, um, actually, I just forgot what the third kind was. It just flipped out of my mind. That's okay. Another, that's okay. There's another level. 
I want to dovetail on something you said earlier, Wendy. You know, I, I'm so pleased that, that you said men can be part of the solution too. You know, so often I'm out there speaking to women and there uh, is a pervasive men are bad fear. And, and I, I, like you, disagree completely. I think men can be a part of this solution and they can empower women leaders as well. And I think they play a significant role. And I know myself, I've benefited from terrific male mentors and even sponsors who have helped me grow my career. So thank you for, for helping our audience understand too. The men are an integral part of this solution. Oh, absolutely. And I love the statement, and I forget where I heard this, but men, men are not the enemy. Conventional thinking is the enemy. Yeah, yeah, that's and, great. And men are, I was just at, at LinkedIn the other day, and there was this, I met this manager who was a boss of someone that I was coaching, and he was saying to me, I said, you know, I, young guy, young guy, and I think he's a, I think he's a millennial. Uh, no, no, not millennial. He's a, what's the 35? I'm sorry. I was. Uh, so he's a little bit older. So he's Gen X. Gen mm -hmm. X, right. Um, he was saying, I said, you know, I bet you, you're the kind of guy who really would want to do anything you could to make sure that women have equality in leadership and in pay and companies. He goes, I said, but you guys are afraid to say anything because you're afraid you're going to step on, say the wrong thing. Yeah. Or, or, you know, you're walking on eggshells. You're kind of like not bringing it up because you're trying to neutralize and treat everyone the same, which we're not. And he goes, Oh my God, you have to write a LinkedIn post about <laughs> because every, every guy I know thinks that way. And it's so true. You know, now there is this old guard that right. might not be quite as, as on board like that. But let's remember that we need the men who have established these structures that are a little bit outdated to sponsor and support us in re-engineering them for the success of the company and the long-term success of all everyone in it. Brilliant. And I, I love that that this uh, young man in his early 30s is enlightened and, and part yeah. of the movement. So we thank him. <laughs> yes, love him. So Wendy, what's your vision for what's possible next? Because as we've discussed, it's it's a great time. Oh, yeah, it is. You know, I was just going to participate in a conference called It's Time 2015, which was all about bringing together women and men to elevate women's leadership and it, it really made me understand the incredible importance of gender partnership in terms of our future. It's just what it's so led into this from what you just said. It's this integration first of our own internal feminine and internal masculine, which is what my book is about. Mm -hmm. So what I mean by that is we've downplayed our feminine energy as women because we equate it with weakness sometimes. In our culture, it has been portrayed that way. But when we recognize that the feminine, when you think of a mother bear and somebody trying to mess with one of her cubs. Oh, yeah. I, Ferocious, I, right? Oh, thank you. That is feminine also. Mm -hmm. And when we put our masculine strengths like linear thinking and strategic planning and getting stuff done and building things, we put all that in service to our feminine wisdom and values, then we've got something amazing that will happen in our culture. It's something we have to do internally in ourselves first, and then we have to partner to find what can we bring, what's the best that we can bring out of our men to support the wisdom that women have, the insight that women have, the intuition that women have about what is the next right thing right in this moment. We can be in the moment and know that each one of us, if we stay in the moment, we can ask ourselves, if we stay connected to the truth of who we are, we can ask ourselves that question and get an answer. What is the next right thing for me? And that inner guidance on a whole level, if everyone or more people were doing that, we would hand in hand, men and, men and women, and across the gender spectrum, elevate our humanity rather than just getting stuff done and trying to make more, you know, inventions and scientific discoveries and war and all the other things that we do when the masculine is unguided, right. when it doesn't have a purpose. So Wendy, I would say, 
I have you, a hope. You're a joy. And, and I can hear the enthusiasm in your voice. And I, I am so grateful to you uh, on a personal level. I, I love your book. And I want to remind our audience, Spiraling Upward, the five co-creative powers for women on the rise. And Wendy Walbridge is a rock star in every way. <laughs> and I'm just so honored and delighted that she could spend some time with me today on the show. But Wendy, tell us, how can we buy the book? How can we follow you online? Because you're very active. And I'm sure that some women listening will want to reach out and, and pursue Sue, your coaching. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, on Twitter, I'm Wendy Walbridge. That's Walbridge, like a wall and a bridge. I, you can also get me Wendy Walbridge online. My website is that or Spiral Up. It'll both take you there. SpiralUp.com, S-P-I-R-A-L-U-P. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm, I think, did you ask me where to buy the book? Uh, yeah. Amazon, Amazon has the book. Um, it's all over. So just put in spiraling upward in your browser and you'll find. You'll find it. Yes, you are. You are very findable, which is a good, good thing. <laughs> yeah. Wendy, truly, what a joy. And I'm just so delighted you. that you were able to share time with me today. I hope our paths cross in person soon. I would love to see okay. you. Me too. And I, I thank you for your energy and your passion and your wisdom and all that you're doing to empower women. Thank you so, so much. I just a joy to meet you, Caroline. And I did a really would love to meet you. So I hope we get to do that. Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. And okay. I want to thank the listening audience for tuning into your working life, where my goal is to help you design your career destiny so it doesn't happen by default. True career and life satisfaction is really possible. And it's time to embrace what you love doing so you can do more of it. I'm Caroline Dowd Higgins. Take good care.